What's up guys, it's DDP back for another Mavericks post-game show and unfortunately tonight we do not have another Mavericks victory to talk about. We are instead finding ourselves in at least a six-game stretch without superstar Luka Doncic at the helm for the Mavericks. So the offense is going to look a little bit out of sorts. Now they did manage to turn it on in the second half, particularly in the fourth quarter. But ultimately here, we're talking about game one without Luka and a 128-121 loss in Houston. A couple things to point out real quick. With this loss, this is the first loss of the year for the Mavericks within the Southwest Division, making them 7-1 and one now on the year. This is also their, what, second matchup against the Rockets this year? Surprisingly little action against them thus far in the first half of the season. But all the same... We knew that when we went into Houston last time, the Mavericks really took it to the Rockets. And so we kind of expected them to come back really engaged in this game and really wanting vengeance. So with the fact that Luka was out, it kind of played right into that hand for them. Although they weren't at full strength either. They were also missing Clint Capella. They didn't have a single player more than six foot seven in height. And that did allow the Mavericks to control some things to a significant degree. Player of the game for the Mavericks, probably Kristaps Porzingis, 35 points, season high 35 points, only his second 30 point game as a Maverick, and 12 rebounds on 12 of 20 shooting, only one of four behind, behind the arc. I actually like that. I like four or fewer three point attempts. When KP starts shooting six, seven, eight, nine threes, that's where I start to, my eyes roll back in my head basically, and I, I just go comatose, like it's over. Same with Luca, frankly. But KP, much better in that regard. 10 of 13 in the line. He didn't miss two in a crucial moment. The Rockets actually challenged a call, didn't win the challenge, but then KP missed the free throws anyway. That was a bummer. But in this game, Dallas dealt with a little bit of adversity in the second and third quarter. By the end of the third quarter, about 30 seconds left in the third quarter, they were down like 18 points. The Rockets had just gotten a thunderous dunk in transition. Westbrook stomping his feet and all that. And the crowd's going nuts. And it looked like it was going to be an absolute rout in the fourth quarter. Until Seth Curry stepped up. Seth Curry really got the Mavericks going in the fourth quarter. Scored, I think, 12 points, 12 of his 16 points in the fourth quarter there. And helped keep Dallas alive. Because KP, similar to what the Mavericks will do with Luka, KP didn't check back end of the game until about six minutes and change left so that first half of the fourth quarter a pivotal frame obviously being the fourth quarter but a pivotal stretch of time wherein no superstar power was out there for Dallas Seth Curry stepped up in those first uh, 10 points he scores in the corner uh, in the quarter he is four or five from the field with a pair of assists that is instrumental other callouts in this game, J.J. Barea gets the start. He goes 11 points, 5 boards, 9 assists in 21 minutes. He basically had a double-double at halftime. Not much play in the second half, but his offense in the very first start of the game was pretty important for Dallas as it tried to just kind of feel things out. Now, I mentioned earlier how Houston didn't have anyone more than six foot seven in this game without Clint Capella, and that was an advantage for Dallas. In fact, Dallas gets more block shots, wins the rebounding battle by 15, including doubling them up on the offensive glass, 14 to 7. Nine blocks compared to five, so I mentioned they won that. There's two areas of this game where Houston really won. Because if you look down the rest of the stat sheet, Dallas outshot Houston from the field, 48% compared to 46. Houston won this game in large part because of the three ball. Dallas, 14 of 36 for 39%. Not bad by any means. But Houston shot nearly 50% from beyond the arc. 21 of 45. That was the key difference here. They obviously are able to cash in on those extra points. They win the game by seven. You see kind of the correlation there. Additionally, Houston, far fewer turnovers. Dallas, Dallas is... Probably the best team, if not the best, the second best team in the league in terms of fewest turnovers per game. But they had 17 turnovers in this game without Luka Doncic. And 11 of those, 11 of those were just steals. 
They weren't throwing the ball out of bounds. They were ball going the other direction. And I don't have the fast break points in front of me, but it felt like Houston decidedly held an edge in that regard as well. Uh, so those are those are things you have to look at. And on the other end, Dallas couldn't force turnovers to save their lives. KP, I think, had two steals, actually, and a block. But two steals, and that's just two. That's two of Houston's measly six turnovers for the game. That's that's ridiculous. That's not near enough defensive pressure from Dallas. Meanwhile, Dallas wins the assist battle. Even without Luka, they win the assist battle 29-25. to Now, Harden and Westbrook are the best one-two combination in the league in terms of points per game. Coming in at about 10 points above the next best representative in that case. I want to say they're like 62.8 points, they said in the broadcast, per game between those two guys. They're obviously both all-stars, and that's... That's really good for them, but this is an opportunity. This was an opportunity for Dallas, I feel, to win this game. Even when even when they fell way behind, the fact that they kept clawing back into the game, down 18 with 30 seconds left in the third quarter, crawl all the way back several times, cutting the lead to just three points. They can't ever get over the hump because it goes the other way and Houston hits a three, or they get an and one, or whatever. It just kept moving the ball just a little bit further out of reach for Dallas, it felt like, in terms of climbing all the way back in. They never fully erased that massive deficit, but they showed a lot of heart and a lot of guts. Like I said, you got your best scoring night of the year out of KP. And yes, when Houston doesn't have anyone who can match his size, that's what you would want. But at the same, you I mean, you would kind of expect it. It's not to say he was perfect. In fact, as I look here, not one Maverick starter had a positive plus minus but let me look through Houston's stats here but KP offered you a lot in that regard 12 of 20 from the field for 35 points didn't shoot too many threes felt like him being more of a focal point in the office offense was a real positive for the Mavericks and you know the Mavericks have been just snake bitten with injuries throughout this season they've had to deal with with injuries obviously you have the major one to Powell now where he's lost for the year but they've also had to deal with significant injuries to Luca uh, about a month ago he missed several games with the turned ankle now he's out for at least six games here his first game back may very well be the all-star game he wants to play in that he's only the second Maverick to ever be a starter in that game so hey gotta acknowledge it uh, additionally you have to factor in um the KP injury before missed 10 games he sat out a couple other games as well I think so KP's already at 11 games which was the bare minimum I think the Mavericks projected for him to miss this year so when you factor that in I think they I think they said like 11 to 22 games and he's already at 11 um granted when they said that that was intending uh rest in that regard and obviously he missed 10 for legitimate soreness so uh that it's a different ball game there they've also had injuries to tim hardaway jr that really hurt them they're typically third best scorer in this game hardaway 15 points on 5 of 12 shooting four of nine from beyond the arc you got 12 and 8 out of dorian finney smith that's pretty quality there not too many shots out of dorian brokov the accountant locked into the starting lineup gives you nine points and five boards in 20 minutes three of eight from the field overall three of seven from beyond the arc Nice to see him get his first start of his career. Hey, he blocked James Harden at the rim. What the hell was that about? (laughs) You don't see that very often. In fact, of the starters, he actually had the best uh, plus minus at a minus four. So I don't know. Uh, Off the bench, you got 10 points out of DeLon Wright. 10, 2, and 3 out of him. You got 16, 2, and 4 out of Curry. Brunson, and Brunson gave you a little something. Maxi did not have a great game. 14 minutes, 4.6 boards, and an assist. 1 of 4 from the field. Not very good for Maxi tonight. Willie Cauley-Stein in his second game with the Mavericks. He got um, 11 minutes of action, 2 points, 6 boards, 2 assists, and a block. And it was a good block. It was during that stretch when the Mavericks were really climbing back into this game in the fourth quarter. I want to see more Willie Cauley-Stein. I know that... He can bring a lot to the game that you could get out of Powell. You're not going to fully replace that, but Cuban had alluded to in the days prior to this game, Cauley Stein being, quote, a steal and a half. And the implication there 
if, if you saw the full context of the quote, he's not just talking about the rest of this year. He's even talking about when Powell is back next year because the Mavericks have Cauley Stein for next year as well. Basically, the value of his addition to the team. And when you consider the fact that the pick that they gave up to Golden State to get Cauley Stein is effectively uh, the 56th pick in the draft. Yeah, there's 60 picks in the draft. So when you're giving up 56, the, the Jazz second round pick, that's pretty good. They also, to make the numbers of it work, ended up having to use that Harrison Barnes trade exception, which would have expired at midnight tonight. As I record this, it's about 11.15. Uh, so that expired tonight, basically, if the Mavericks didn't use it. They used it. So, hey, you got something for it at least. I think Dallas will look to make a trade. I think they're going to look to pick up something at the three or four. Regardless, I want to see more Willie Cauley-Stein here because in his first two appearances for the Mavericks, it's been very sporadic minutes. And I think that, you know, I understand having to work him into the flow of things, but I also understand that if he can if, if he can give you something like Dwight Powell gives this team, you need to have him because – this team without that Dwight Powell element is a little bit hamstrung. It's kind of like someone is taking a sledgehammer to your ankle and then asking you to run a marathon or let's shorten the, the distance, a sprint in this case, after they've taken a sledgehammer to your ankle. And that's kind of the impression there. So it's like, okay, well, we don't have Powell at this point. So if this guy's offering a lot of what Powell offered us, how about we get him in there and see where that goes? It's just something Dallas needs to, I think, work him more into the flow for because I do think it'll have a significant impact for the, for the team in general. And with Luke out for a little bit, you need any little elements you can get. We saw this team go 2-2 two and two without Luka earlier in the year, and a lot of that had to do simply with the shooters on this team playing lights out. Yes, KP stepped up his game. Yes, tonight seemed to indicate that he, was going to, that he is going to do so again. But you still have to see the overall scope of everything in that regard. You have to see how guys are going to step up and how energy players are going to play. With Powell, one of those main energy guys, being out, fine. You got Cauley Stein, throw him in there, get what you can out of him production-wise. Now, I mentioned earlier in the game, uh, the Mavericks' defense overall wasn't bad, but it was a three-point line that really betrayed them. Russell Westbrook in 40 minutes gives you gives the Rockets, rather, 32, 6, and 9, near triple-double there. I mean, not near, near, six boards. But 13 of 28 from the field. Here's a big thing that has been a significant boost to Houston since we played them previously. Russell Westbrook shooting 23% on threes this year has almost completely stopped shooting threes, and the Rockets have been all the better for it. 0 for 1 tonight for Westbrook from three, but he's also able to give them three steals He's a plus six for the game. And uh, turnovers, only one for Westbrook. So for someone who has a reputation being a little bit out of control and loose with the ball at times, there you go. Like, we weren't able to force any turnovers. We turned it over way too much, and Houston beat us from beyond the arc. That's essentially where the game boiled down. I mean, I know that I know we had three technicals. Rick picked up one. Um, the other ones are slipping my mind at the moment. But we had three technicals we picked up. So that's significant, too. I mean, it's three free points, which is you know, the equivalent of another made three for Houston, who already shot 47% and made 21 threes in the game. But all the same, that's really where this game, uh, in a modern basketball age, where that game got away from Dallas, where you look at a bunch of key stats that in the past you would have looked at and said, how did the Mavericks lose this game? Well, you see in the certain areas, turnovers, threes, that pretty much wraps it up for them. Uh, let's see here. James Harden, meanwhile, 35 points, 16 boards, and 6 assists. 10 of 25 from the field, 6 of 14 from beyond the arc, 9 of 10 at the line, and 4 steals by himself. That's ridiculous that the backcourt for Houston gave them 7 steals. Other, other major contributors, Eric Gordon, 17 points. I know he dropped 50 just the other day. Uh, 17 points for him. House gave 14 points. And McLemore, off the bench, 13 points as well. Rivers, 9 points. I mean, pretty balanced approach from Houston in this game here. So, yeah, there's not a whole lot more to say on this game. I'm, I'm proud of the team for fighting back into it. Like I said, late in the third quarter, the final minute of the third quarter, when that inflated to 18 points, I really got the impression like, ooh, this could be a bloodbath in the fourth quarter, kind of like uh, the second half was the other night against Phoenix when the Mavericks looked like they were asleep on their feet. Thankfully, it didn't turn that way. The Mavericks showed a lot of character. I know we're sick and tired of talking about the Mavericks in these 
clutch situations here. They've they've not performed well. They've only won. I don't think they've won a game yet this year when they trailed in the final four minutes. I think I heard on uh, the ticket earlier today they had Mark Followell on for a segment uh, to talk about the Mavericks, and I think he dropped that my uh, that mind blowing stat there. So they've not been good. They've not been good, and in games decided by five points or less, I think they only got five wins on the year. I don't know how many losses as losses that's against, but they're 16 and seven now on the road overall, compared to just 13 and 12 at home. Of the potential playoff teams in the Western Conference, they are the only one who is basically a 500 team at home and has been substantially better. Hey, say what you want, they're still better than two to one ratio on the road. And if you're pulling that off, you're usually a very good team. Thing is, we can't, you know, we can't take care of things at home. So they're going to have to embrace this road warrior mentality. And, you know, in a game like this, they still showed that grit and that fight. They're still a young team, and they're a team that, because of how the roster is uh, configured with these different contracts and everything, I think we'll see some changes. I think they'll make a deal for a defensive three or four, small forward or power forward. I don't know what exactly it's going to be, but that would be my guess, is that they try and sure that up even further. But even still, uh, this is a team that's just going to have to grow and learn together, learn how to win, fight through that adversity now when you're not performing very well right now. Hopefully you can start to turn that corner as the season wears on. Certainly if you can get into the playoffs by the time the playoffs get here, hopefully you've turned that corner on late game um, finishing it basically figuring out how to fight through and overcome poor performances or whatever down the stretch hopefully you can turn that corner and if it's not this year then it damn sure needs to be next year because if we get into next year and we're more than 20 games into the year a fourth of the way basically into the year and they're still seeing some of these same problems well then you have to make significant changes and I don't think Iggy is that change I know veteran leadership we we put a lot of value into that I don't think that's the the get that the Mavericks need to make here. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see what they end up doing. But that's going to do it for my time here, guys. Thank you for watching. I know I haven't been posting a lot lately. School has been kicking my ass to no end. I am operating on very little sleep. And uh, I'm, I'm doing my best. So until next time, don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, buy the shirts on represent.com, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.